Welcome to the 2022 Runaway in Homeless Youth National Grantee Training. Please welcome to the stage Debbie Powell, Deputy Associate Commissioner for the Family and Youth Services Bureau. Hello, my name is Debbie Powell and I serve as the Deputy Associate Commissioner for the Family and Youth Services Bureau referred to as FISB. It is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to our 2022 Runaway and Homeless Youth National Training, Resilience, the Power of Youth, Community, and Connections. And I've got to tell you, I look forward to this event every year, to learning with you, sharing with you, and feeling the incredible energy that you all bring to this work each and every day. The RHY team, including our amazing federal staff, our Runaway and Homeless Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center, our GEARS contractor, the partner that manages the Youth and Families Clearinghouse, our National Runaway Safe Line partner, and many others who have worked hard to put this event together. And I want to say how grateful I am for your efforts. I also acknowledge our young people, RHY providers, advocates, research teams, and external federal partners who have worked diligently this year to provide the content that we will celebrate over the next three days. To reflect a bit on that content, last month we published what we have learned from RHY grantees based on our Get to Know a Grantee series of blog posts. Our summary included insights from 10 RHY grantees across all four RHY programs and highlights the leadership that all of you show. For example, RHY grantees and their partners are authentically supporting LGBTQ youth, engaging young people, using trauma-informed care, and confronting the realities of human trafficking through identification and prevention. Programs are building trust by listening without judgment to young people's experience, acknowledging traumatic life events, and helping to grow their self-efficacy and belief in the future. Programs have navigated the pandemic by using creative strategies to keep the doors open, even when it seemed almost impossible to do so. Grantees are taking a deep look into their program models, intake processes, outcomes, frontline staff and leadership to ensure they offer culturally relevant interventions that serve their young people well and better reflect the populations being served, particularly for Black, Brown, Indigenous, and other young people of color, as well as LGBTQ plus youth. RHY organizations are constantly improving the models for and delivery of life skills, training that will impact a young person's ability to thrive during and long after they leave our programs. If you are looking for some inspiration or to celebrate the great work of your colleagues, I would encourage you to take a look at the Get to Know a Grantee series of blog posts. To the grantee practices that were highlighted today and to all of you, thank you, thank you. We could not do this work without you. Over the course of the training, you will hear from inspirational people like our amazing keynote speakers, Dr. Sean Genwright and Jeremy Anderson on topics ranging from authentic youth partnership and innovative service models to ideas for community-wide collaboration, issues of health and well-being, and the intersection of youth homelessness and parallel systems like foster care, juvenile justice, immigration, and more. But those of you who know me can probably guess what I want to spend the rest of my welcome remarks talking to you about. The people who help make our programs work. Staff mental health and well-being. It is very easy to get into a pattern of putting ourselves last. After all, if we don't do the work, a young person may have to sleep on the street be subjected to violence, trauma, or worse. So what's an extra five minutes of our time? A lunch break deferred, a 2 a.m. phone call, 
or a skipped weekend family event compared to what a homeless youth must be experiencing. And yet we know if we neglect ourselves, if we are physically and mentally exhausted or experiencing unacknowledged vicarious trauma, we cannot be our best selves for the young people who need us to be our best selves. Two years ago, I quoted the Dalai Lama, reminding that us that there can be no world peace without inner peace. We cannot do this work well unless we are whole ourselves. That the most important first step toward positive mental health and well-being for you and myself in this field is identifying when you need to stop and take a break. When we work ourselves to the bone, we might feel restless, exhausted, mentally or physically. We might feel anxious or depressed, overwhelmed or fearful, lose patience or focus, feel more irritable than normal or increasingly cynical and negative about our work or the organization. These are not easy things to confront or talk about in any field, but especially our field. We are supposed to be the ones helping others. What does it say about me? I'm a seasoned case manager, a supervisor, an expert consultant, or executive director. What does it say if I need help myself? Our programs are trying to stretch every dollar and every hour. And so who has time and the money? But are we really going to sacrifice our staff mental health and well-being? We must create space to talk about mental health and well-being among staff. And then we must take action to address them. It will be a sacrifice very well rewarded. And this has only become more important in the past three years. Many of you have prioritized hiring more and more staff with lived homelessness experience on the front lines, in the president's chairs, and on the board, and I commend you for this. This is a critical to ending youth homelessness in America. And we need be especially attentive to how the experiences of young clients and guests trigger the intense feelings of vivid memories from our own challenging journeys. The good news is there are resources out there to help you create an organization that prioritizes staff mental health and well-being. While I have discussed some of these resources in the past, and one of our keynote speakers from the last year shared her deep experience with radical self-care, I want to finish by highlighting a resource that you might not have considered. The Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program, a sister program to RHY here at FISB, has focused on mental health this year and developed a series of documents and webinars that include tips, and tools relevant both for young program participants and to you all here today. Under the banner of the We Think Twice campaign, we have developed a mental health landing page with engaging content in the form of listicles, which are articles that get to the point using concise lists with interactive surveys. This content helps you better understand the neuroscience of mental health offers healthy habits and mindfulness, tips to stop negative self-talk, discusses the intersection of mental health on social media, and includes general mental health facts. I am personally a fan of the motivational screen lock graphics that you could also print and put on your wall, reminding you to show yourself some love during the workday. These resources work just as well with older adults as with young adults and youth. And you can even build these resources into your work that you do together with your clients to double the benefit. In April, the campaign held a webinar specifically focused on grief, which many of us and our clients confront on a daily basis, and which we all experience at high levels through the pandemic. The resources highlighted the work of Roberta's House, and is a deep dive in the how and why and what to do with trauma. I strongly encourage you to check it out, but while it's a great resource to use with your young people, I want to encourage you to be a little selfish and ask how it might apply to you. 
How are we building resilience among us and our colleagues that we are showcasing this week for our young people? How are we increasing our capacity to successfully adapt despite challenging or threatening circumstances that we confront or carry with us to work? There are a lot of great ideas in these resources and we must prioritize using them. You are the reason we have RHY programs. You bring our laws, policies, and programs to life and ensure that we are helping our young people thrive. Investing in their mental health and well being is how we ensure that you are at your best and thriving as well. National Runaway Prevention Month, another priority in our work is collaboration. And every November, the National Runaway Prevention Month campaign reminds us of the importance of collaborating to elevate the voices of youth experiencing homelessness across communities nationwide. And one shared message, shine a light on runaway incidents and youth homelessness. Before sharing how we can support this, nation's, this national effort, I wanted to share our new National Runaway Prevention Month or NRPM video developed by the National Runaway Safe Line in collaboration with FISB, RHY programs, young people, and youth serving organizations. It is an energetic, energetic call to action that I know will resonate with you as well. There are approximately 4.2 million young people living in the streets, in shelters, or couch surfing each year. Youth experiencing homelessness face dangers on the streets and may have difficulty finding food, accessing health care, and remaining in school. Youth homelessness is a very real problem affecting both urban and rural communities across America. About 1 in 30 teens between the ages of 13 and 17 experience homelessness each year. These are classmates, friends, and other young people who may not have a safe place to go at the end of the school day. It is critical that we work to prevent and ultimately end runaway incidents and youth homelessness. One way to support young people is by joining National Runaway Prevention Month, or NRPM. Every November, the National Runaway Safe Line leads this important public awareness campaign to shine a light on the issues facing youth who have left home due to family conflict or other crisis, or have experienced homelessness or housing instability. It also is an opportunity to spotlight resources available to support youth and young adults and to empower communities to take action. NRPM is successful because of the incredible community of partner organizations who participate in the campaign. Partner organizations and youth ambassadors from across the country are helping to spread the word and shine a light in their local communities about the issues facing young people who have run away or are experiencing homelessness and the critical importance of prevention and the prevention work that we highlight during NRPM. Partners share information and data on social media, host special events, engage local governments to issue proclamations and light buildings in green, the color of NRPM, and so much more. Join us as a National Runaway Prevention Month partner. NRS provides support and resources and invites partners to participate in several national events, such as the Twitter chat, Wear Green Day, and Project Green Light. Together, we can help young people reach their full potential and enjoy fulfilling lives. For more information and to register as a partner, visit 1-800-RUNAWAY.ORG slash NRPM. I want to personally invite you to support NRPM. There are so many ways that you and your organization can engage in NRPM. You can become an NRPM national partner by visiting the NRPM website and registering to all of the upcoming events. Receive free resources and technical support to host your local event. This year, the RHY National Clearinghouse training is also shining a light. You can visit the National Runaway Safe Line virtual booth to learn more about the NRPM campaign. You can also sign the NRPM commitment card and take a picture, please do, which will be featured on our commitment wall. 
I'm excited about this year's campaign. I am also thankful for the work and dedication of the National Runaway Safe Line, as well as FISB staff for all your work in preparing and coordinating this national campaign. We do this with the commitment and belief that everyone can do something to elevate the voices of a young person experiencing homelessness. Let's do this by shining a light with the NRPM campaign. Next, I have the great pleasure of introducing the Family and Youth Services Bureau Associate Commissioner, Kimberly Waller. While this is her first national training in that role, I know that Kimberly is a familiar face to many of you. Whether you met her as an advisor to the U.S. Senate, working across health and human services, or as a FISB policy advisor, working on youth homelessness and domestic violence prevention issues, or leading local and state efforts as an advisor, lawyer, and advocate, you know how dedicated Kimberly is to preventing and ending youth homelessness, working innovatively across systems and agencies and elevating young people to positions of influence and power. Please join me in welcoming FISB's Associate Commissioner, Kimberly Waller. Thank you for the kind introduction, Debbie. I can't overstate or tell you all often enough how lucky we are to have such a dedicated, hardworking, and passionate career public servant team at FISB. They really are deeply um, invested and care deeply about the young people in this country who are experiencing homelessness and housing instability. And truly, regardless of who sits in my chair, they work tirelessly to ensure that FISB programming its grants, technical assistance, and resources are working just as hard and effectively to help you all end youth homelessness and housing instability in your communities. So thank you. And thank you so much to our technical assistance teams for putting together this amazing training. There are so many hours that go into this and the events supporting National Runaway Prevention Month and similar events throughout the year. You all support our FISB websites, operating our RITEC.net, the National Runaway Safe Line, and the National Clearinghouse producing guides, tutorials, blogs, evidence reviews, videos, and so much more, and really responding directly to our stakeholders' needs as they work to better serve young people. And thank you to our attendees. Thanks for taking time out of your really busy days and really busy schedules for showing up for young people, for your clients and guests and peers, for yourselves, not just today, but every day. I hope that you feel our gratitude in every session and presentation this week. I hope that, the, the, that this training answers your questions, inspires new ideas, offers new connections and relationships, and fills you with an energy that you can take home and use to dive back into the work with renewed momentum. You deserve nothing less, and I hope we live up to that promise to you. When I joined FISB as Associate Commissioner in 2021, I spoke about four key areas of focus, and those are the importance of coordination and collaboration, which um, Debbie, of, of course, spoke to, equity and inclusion, leadership from people with lived expertise, and data-driven decision-making. And I think that it's really important to know that these are not simply agenda items or checkboxes that I expect to achieve and then move on to the next four focus areas next year. I really believe that these four areas serve as a framework, the scaffolding with which we build and improve all our programming and resources together. And so first, if we are not coordinating and collaborating across agencies in the federal government, across organizations, departments, and jurisdictions in your communities, then we are never going to holistically support our young people who are at the mercy of those systems and entities and who needs stand at the intersection of our bureaucratic boundaries. There is no magical entity that meets all young people's needs. We all know this. And so it is our responsibility to do whatever we can to make it feel as close to that as possible. And you all do such a wonderful job of that. And as a byproduct, I believe that we will end up more efficiently using our resources, better understanding the challenges through shared data and developing innovative solutions as people from different backgrounds come together and work together. HUD's Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program has been an example of that with such strong leadership 
from RHY funded agencies in every awarded community. And I want to congratulate the 17 new YHDP communities awarded on October 25th and challenge you to coordinate broadly and, and collaborate deeply. And thank you for all of you that invest your time and leadership and expertise in that work. Second, if we are not talking about equity and inclusion, about justice and liberation for Black, Brown, Indigenous, and LGBTQIA2S plus young people, we are not talking about ending youth homelessness and housing instability. We need to address head on the disparities and the prevalence and severity of experiences based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and gender identity. We need to look at our programs and leadership, who holds power and who is left without representation. We need to listen to those who have been historically marginalized or underserved, create space for them to lead, set up successful pathways forward, and be willing to take action even when it is inconvenient, hard, or requires sacrifice. In March of this year, we released our FISB Equity Action Plan in response to the President's executive order in advancing racial equity. In it, we describe how we have updated our Notice of Funding Opportunities, or NOFOs, to include equity and diversity requirements for grantees. We've infused equity, inclusion, and diversity in all our events, technical assistance, and resources, engaged grantees to better understand how they are incorporating equity, inclusion, and diversity in your programming, because we know that you all have been doing this for a long time and we need to do it together, and worked with youth and families with lived experience to improve FISB program design and implementation. There is a lot more work to do, and in that same release, we outlined a few of our next steps, including further strengthening our NOFOs with regard to diversity and, and equity, deepening our engagement of people with lived experience through listening sessions, better incorporating um, youth and, and families as expert grant reviewers, and producing guidance to encourage their inclusion in all aspects of program design, implementation, and improvement, and by incorporating equity and lived expertise across program monitoring and site reviews. So lots more to do together. Third, if young people are not leading our movement with our full endorsement, with our trust and backed by the resources and guidance they need to succeed, then we're not gonna address the right problems or implement the right solutions needed to end youth homelessness and housing insecurity. We have made a lot of progress over the past several years with your leadership and support. More young people than ever are actively participating in the decision-making processes at federal, state, and local levels. Young people with lived experience are advisors, consultants, grant writers, and reviewers, board members, and executives. There are youth action boards in nearly every community, and Youth Catalyst members have designed, facilitated, and participated in FISB events all year long, and I want to personally thank you for your expertise and your guidance to us. This is real progress that we should celebrate, and anyone who has supported young people in leadership knows that authentic youth partnership is hard. It's hard work. It is one thing to create space for their leadership and another to set up a space for success. We have young leaders here who can tell you exactly when they have been authentically supported and when they have not experienced that authenticity. Let's keep asking them and responding to their advice. We have programs and staff who have been leaning into the challenges and wonderful opportunities that come with maintaining youth action boards, hiring and managing former clients and mentees and wrestling with challenges like professional development, compensation, taxes, and state employment law. Over the next year, let's double down on our commitment to youth leadership by better understanding how to do it well for our young people. Let's commit to sacrificing tradition, old policy, time, and funding to ensure that they are successful. And finally, we are not using data and if we are not using data and evidence to drive our decision-making, we are unlikely to make effective decisions regarding limited resources, convince new partners that we need to collaborate argue for new funding or improve our programming. FISB is committed to supporting your community's efforts to use data and evidence to make the right decisions for your stakeholders. We work closely with our federal partners to support local implementation of HMIS and data analysis. We regularly update the National Clearinghouse, which we are redesigning so that it is truly a one-stop shop for the best evidence regarding youth homelessness and intersecting issues. And we contribute our own evidence summaries and reviews to help you make the most informed decisions. And we learn from you and with you in the process. To model data-driven decision-making, we work with RITAC and Chapin Hall to produce an annual national needs assessment completed by a majority of grantees who operate FISB-funded RHY programs. We use this um, to learn about how grantees are implementing their programs, which 
best practices they are using and how we are all coordinating with community partners. It identifies critical grantee needs for technical assistance like screening for trauma and adverse childhood experiences, addressing equity and inclusion for marginalized populations, promoting mental health among clients and staff, and tailoring content to meet the needs of specific groups. We have already used the preliminary results of this year's uh, data and um, infused it in our technical assistance through 2022. Data is not perfect and data does not make decisions. We need to be honest about gaps in the information that we collect and bias and how it is analyzed. And we need to commit to using it and improving it with full transparency about its limitations if we wanna understand where we are and where we are going. My team and I, who I am so thankful for, are committed to embedding these four key areas into all the work that we do, coordination and collaboration, equity and inclusion, leadership from people with lived expertise and data-driven decision-making. And part of our work is to help you and your communities do the same. So with that, I am so excited to spend these next few days learning with you all and excited for all of us to share space with our two phenomenal keynote speakers. We have a truly special keynote speaker today in Dr. Sean Jinwright, and please join me in welcoming him to our stage. Dr. Jinwright is an Oakland-based scholar, professor, author, activist, innovator, founder, advisor, board member, researcher, award winner, and so, so much more. He is sometimes described as a provocateur, someone who pushes our country to reimagine justice, youth development, hope, healing the experience of young African-Americans, democracy, and ourselves. He is an incredible thought leader who was well ahead of the curve in describing the shift from trauma-informed care to healing-centered engagement. He's the founder and CEO of the Flourish Agenda, a national nonprofit consulting firm that works with youth of color schools, youth serving organizations, foundations, and local governments to build and implement strategies that allow young people to flourish. I encourage you to learn about, read, and engage with all his works after hearing him speak today. They shine a light on the values, visions, and aspirations of the training this week and all that we hope to achieve at FISB and RHY. Please join me in a warm welcome to Dr. Sean Jenright. Thank you so much, Associate Commissioner Waller and Commissioner Powell. Uh, it is an honor, a pleasure to join the Family and Youth Services Bureau movement uh, to really uh, address and support the transformation of young people in their lives and, the, and in their communities. Um, we all know uh, that um, the issues, the conditions, the challenges that we face in our community-based organizations, um, in our city governments to support young people uh, have been challenging. And we know that uh, the issues uh, in schools and in neighborhoods create challenges for young people and their families to thrive. We, we re uh, last year around this time, uh, a report uh, was produced uh, by the U.S. Surgeon General that highlighted the epidemic, the sort of crisis that we are in as a society to address youth mental health. And while that report certainly um, memorialized the challenges that we're facing uh, regarding youth mental health, we also recognize that the adult providers have very fragile and frail systems of support to support their own mental health. So um, I, I just want to applaud Commissioner Powell's strategy and emphasis and dedication and commitment um, and an associate Commissioner Waller's um, uh, just commitment to assuring that there are supports to support the mental health and well-being of the adults of providers, as well as robust strategies to support a movement uh, to partner with young people to transform the systems in ways that support their well-being and thriving. Um, I want to talk today about um, two, two, two issues, really. The first is trauma. We recognize and know that trauma is, uh, is pervasive in our neighborhoods and society. And I have been trained, like many of you has been trained in addressing trauma with young people in our trauma-informed strategies. And while our trauma-informed strategies are important, uh, there's another tool that we should be considering in our toolbox. And that is healing. 
and how we can begin to think about healing holistically, uh, fully in our institutions, in our relationships with young people and as individuals. And so I hope that uh, my comments challenge, push, inspire, and inform your practice around really creating opportunities for healing in your community-based organizations and in your neighborhoods and in your schools. Um, you, can, you can put up the, uh, the slide deck now. Um, I'd like to start with uh, a story. Um, is the slide deck up? Um, I'd like to start with a, um, a story about, um, uh, th there you go, thank you. I'd like to start with a story that helps to sort of set the stage for understanding why healing is important in our, in our country. And this is a, a story that happened to me actually about 10 years ago. Um, I was asked to come to a, a, a prison not far from my home here in Oakland to talk to a group of men who had uh, grown up in Oakland and they were reading one of my books and I decided to uh, take the invitation. The invitation read something like this. Dr. Jen Wright, we are um, reading your book uh, about black youth in Oakland. There, there are about 10 to 15 men in a reading group that would love for you to come out to our prison to speak with them. And so I decided to go out to the prison to talk to them about the concepts in my book, uh, about how they grew up in Oakland. And it was my first time ever, actually ever going to a prison. When I, when I arrived at the prison, um, I was given a series of instructions. When I got to the gate, the first correctional officer said, Dr. Jenright, we're so glad you're here. Um, the men are waiting for you in the cafeteria. Just follow the instructions and uh, the instructions will lead you to the cafeteria. And so the first correctional officer that I saw said, Dr. Jenright, there are a lot of colors on the line. Just follow the red line all the way to the end of the corridor. When you get to the end of the corridor, um, there'll be a door. So I found the, the uh, red line on the, uh, on the floor and I followed it all the way to the end of the corridor where I was met with another door. And that door buzzed open, bzzz, and I walked through it and it shut behind me, boom. There was another correctional officer there. And she said, Dr. Jenright, I know you're going to the cafeteria, find the blue line on the floor and just follow this blue line all the way to the end of the next corridor. I looked on the floor and I found the blue line and I followed it all the way to the end of the corridor where I was met with another door and that door buzzed open, bzzz, and I walked through it. Boom, and it shut behind me. Of course, there's another correctional officer there. That correctional officer said, Dr. Jenright, you're almost near the cafeteria. Just find the green line and take it all the way to the end of the hall and you'll be near the cafeteria. I found that green line and I walked all the way to the end of that hall where I was met with the door and that door buzzed open. Bzzz, and I walked through it. Boom, and it shut behind me. But you know, y'all, when that third door shut behind me, something shifted inside of me. I began to feel this, this sense of being captured. I began to feel this sense of, of incarceration. I began to feel trapped. And I began to imagine how the men who I was about to speak to, how they must be feeling every single day, how they're not able to feel the warm sun on their face, how they can't embrace their children. And I became deeply insecure. What am I going to tell these, these men? And so as I got closer to the cafeteria door, um, the door, the cafeteria door swung open. And to my surprise, I had anticipated, you know, like 10 to 15 men. But my surprise, there were 200 men all in their orange jumpsuits waiting for me, right? And I was just like overwhelmed. First man came up to me, he said, hey, Dr. Jenright, man, we're so glad you're here. My name is Greg, man. I've been in here since 1986 and my heart sank. Another man, young man came up to me, hey, Dr. G, we're glad you're here, man. My name is Chris. I'd have been here, I've been in here since 1989. And one by one, those men came up to me and said their name and the year they had entered the prison. And each time they did, I became deeply insecure about what it is I could share with them, what it is that I could tell them. And so they ushered me up on to, onto the stage and all 200 men were waiting for me to speak and I actually did not have a speech ready for them. I wasn't gonna talk to them about my research 
or my boring statistics or whatever I was doing. But instead, I began to talk to them from my heart, y'all. I talked to them about the challenges that I was experiencing as a father here in Oakland, raising a a 16-year-old boy who's six foot tall and my concerns that I have around his safety. I talked to them about the concerns and challenges I'm having with my own parents as they're getting older. And I just kind of talked to them for about 30 to 40 minutes. And one of the things I said to them is that you are not the worst thing you've ever done. And that whatever you've done to bring you here, there's always the ability to heal. And then I said a few other things and they they began to usher me off the stage. And as they ushered me off the stage and that was shaking hands, there was a gentleman, um, older gentleman there that had been in prison for a while. And he was so tall. I'll never forget. I looked up at him and he said, hey, Dr. G. I said, hey, man, how are you doing? He said, I want to let you know, man, that those words that you shared, they really touched me, man. And I said, thank you for that comment. He said, no, I want you to hear me, man. It's hard living in a place like this. This prison is hard, man. A couple months ago, I got in a fight and uh, I got cut. And he showed me a scar that he had on his face. I said, man, I'm so sorry to hear that. He said, no, nah, Dr. Jenright, but you know what, man? There's something that you said that really touched me. I was like, well, what is it? He said that, that there's something we can do to always heal ourselves. And there's something that I do every single day to heal myself in this place because it's hard, man. I said, well, what is it that you do, man? And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a little bottle. You can go to the next slide. And when he pulled out that bottle, he opened the bottle and he blew bubbles. And the bubbles floated above my head. And my first thought was, did this tall brother just blow bubbles in my face in a prison? And I was like, nah, he didn't do that. And the bubbles kept going, he kept blowing bubbles. And then he said to me something I'll never forget. He said, you know, I blow these bubbles because it reminds me when I was a child, my daddy used to take me to the park, man. He used to put me on a swing and he would blow bubbles. And then I would blow those bubbles and we would be, be blow, you would blow bubbles together. And so when I blow these bubbles here, man, it just reminds me of my childhood. It reminds me of a time when I was innocent. It reminds me of a time that I was loved and cared and supported. And it makes being in a place like this this hard, challenging place like this, just a little bit easier. And as I drove home that evening, I was moved by what he had said to me, that it's hard to live in a place like this, but there's things that we can do to make it just a little bit easier. And I became fascinated with, he shared with me his bubble story, but I became fascinated about our bubble stories. What is it that we do to make it just a little bit easier? How do we think about our own well-being and how do we think about the well-being of young people who live in challenging and difficult places? What is your bubble story? What is the bubble story for your own organization and how do you practice that in ways that make it easier and uh, possible for young people to thrive? The challenges that we have before us right now, um, you can go to the next slide. The challenges that we have before us right now are, are significant. These issues that we have, you can go to the next slide, um, that we see create significant stress and stressors in our society. We know that there are movements for black lives and Asian lives. There are challenges between communities around the relationships with policing and public safety. We recognize that unfortunately schools are now having to train and support their teachers and students around school shootings. All of these issues are creating additional stressors in our communities and neighborhoods that requires a different response, that requires that we not just respond to trauma and treat it as a, a type of illness, but the actually root causes of trauma is actually in the environment where our young people and families exist. You can go to the next slide. We also recognize that trauma is, is disproportionate among black and brown communities. This trauma produces mental health that uh, we need to be able to respond to. And in fact, the next slide, please. We recognize that in a study that was done um, by um, 
the a study that was done by uh, um, um, New York University recognized that that on um, more and more African American communities are seeking alternative forms of mental health. This is largely because the conventional forms of mental health are not available or they are, are, are thin, and, thin and frail in black and brown communities and neighborhoods. And it's not just um, African-American communities, you can go to the next slide, that we recognize that, that all of us, as a result of COVID and as a result of these stressors that we see in our society, these school shootings and, and on and on, that, that these stressors have an impact not only on black and brown communities, but all of us. And that it requires that we focus our institutions on ways, focus our institutions on, on being able to support the mental health of the providers as well as the mental health of the young people of young people and their families. Next slide. We can think about how to support young people with, um, with understanding trauma in a particular context. Next slide. Now I was trained to think about trauma in what is called the medical model. And the medical model, um, you could click it again. The medical model you see on the right was a way to think about behavioral and mental health, largely through um, treating issues like depression, anxiety, panic, compulsive activity. We think about responding to trauma from the medical model through treatment and therapy, counseling, and sometimes even health education. And while these responses to trauma is important, the medical model doesn't always provide the most comprehensive way of understanding the root causes of trauma in the first place. And so this social ecological model gives us the ability to expand our understanding of the root causes of trauma in neighborhoods, schools, and communities. And so as we expand our upstream view of looking at trauma, we under, understand that there are social inequalities such as racial bias, racism, classism. We also recognize that there is um, um, issues of immigrant status that make it more difficult. We also know that um, trauma is a result of institutions themselves, right? Institutions that, that um, reproduce policies and practices that actually create traumatic experiences for young people. This could be in schools or nonprofit organizations or sometimes even behavioral health departments in cities. And, and that, lastly, the environment itself, um, the neighborhood, the school, the presence of violence, the, the lack of jobs, all are part and parcel of the ecosystem that create disproportionate um, amounts of trauma in our schools and communities. Um, next slides. Um, I was explaining this concept to my graduate students, and most of us have been familiar and are familiar with the term PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But as I was explaining this, my graduate students recognized that there's something not post. In fact, one of my graduate students said, Dr. G, there ain't nothing post about the trauma that, I, that my young people experience in the neighborhood where I work. She worked in a neighborhood called Bayview Hunters Point in San Francisco. She said the young people that I work with will experience, they experience trauma this week, they might experience next week, and they may experience it next month. There's a persistentness of trauma. And so we began to discuss and try to reframe post-traumatic stress disorder by using this term, persistent traumatic stress environment. By, by using persistent traumatic stress environment, it allows us to do two things. One, it allows us to recognize that stress and traumatic issue, uh, the experience of trauma is not a, always a post experience for young people and their families. And the second thing it allows us to do is it allows us to shift from thinking about the brokenness of young people and families to more broadly thinking about the conditions that young people and their families live in, the environment that produces traumatic stress in the first place. Next slide. And so a, a researcher, uh, his name is James Gabarino, uh, does amazing research, recognizes that that exposure to uh, persistent traumatic stress environments, that exposure, he says, produces social toxicity. What is social? What is a social toxicity, you might ask? 
He says that in his research, in a book called Raising Children on a Socially Toxic Environment, he suggests that when, you're, when you are in a persistent traumatic stress environment, that there are social toxins. And social toxins are like physical toxins. If you think of asbestos and lead paint, Imagine you had asbestos and lead paint in your office or in your home or in your apartment, and you were breathing in asbestos and lead paint every day, that lead paint and asbestos would eventually make you sick. Gabarino says that there are social equivalents to physical toxins, and those are things like fear, uncertainty, shame, anxiety. These things exist in the environment, but oftentimes go undiagnosed. And these things, just as physical toxins, if you're exposed to physical toxins like asbestos and lead paint, it'll eventually make you sick. But if you don't go to the doctor to heal you from that physical exposure, it could become lethal. James Gabarino says that we also need, if we recognize that we have exposure to social toxins, we also need a pathway to heal from our exposure to social toxicity that exists in our environment. Next slide. Here's a model that we could use to explain and visualize how we could think about our relationship to our exposure to social toxicity and how we can begin to heal from it. Next slide. This is um, someone that we like to call Mia. And Mia is a social worker. She works with um, runaway and homeless youth. She's a teacher. She cares deeply about transforming the lives of our young people. Next slide. But Mia um, is also exposed to social toxicity. And social toxins are like rain clouds, socially toxic rain clouds. And those social toxic rain clouds are caused by things like racism, transphobia, homophobia, patriarchy. All of these issues rain down on Mia. And unlike regular rain that gets that just wets us from the outside, socially toxic rain gets on the, gets us on the inside. Now Mia is now exposed to that social toxicity, and she sometimes is not aware of that all of these issues are influencing her and her work. Next slide, please. And so, as a result of her exposure to social toxicity, it has an influence on Mia at three levels. It has an influ influence on Mia at the individual level makes her stressed. But that stress also has a relationship on her inter on the interpersonal level with her relationships with her families, with young people, and even those she works about. But social toxicity doesn't stop there. It also has an influence at the institutional level, where the institution itself produces policies, values, and practices that actually produce more social toxicity that goes back out into society and it reproduces itself. So this is a cycle of how social toxicity has an influence on us at three levels. And as a response, that oftentimes we think about addressing these issues at one of these levels. That is, we could focus on providing self-care for me at the individual level, or we could focus on improving their relationships, or we could just change the policies and practices. But this model is pushing us to recognize that healing at all three levels is important to actually transform our exposure to social toxicity to a community and a system and an environment that's full of well being, thriving, and healing and well being. And so, this is next slide. And this is why we need to think about healing centered engagement. And healing centered engagement builds upon our understanding of trauma informed approaches. It says that our response to trauma informed approaches are necessary and important. But we also have to build upon it to build an ecosystem of healing and well being at the institutional level, in our relationships with our colleagues and our young people and families, and at the individual level as, a, as an adult worker in our, in our communities. Next slide. I began to learn about trauma informed um, uh, uh, healing centered approaches uh, as I was working with a group of 10 African American young men uh, some years ago. And I was trained in trauma-informed approaches. And every Thursday night, we would sit in our blue plastic chairs at Laney College here in Oakland. And I would have them recount some of the most challenging and traumatic experiences of their lives. 
My goal was to get them to understand that their current choices and behaviors are a result of some form of trauma. And every night they would, every Thursday night, we would come and eat pizza and we would go around. And one night Marcus stopped me or stopped the entire group. And he said, Dr. G, man, you know, you know, I, I, I like coming here and talking and, you know, you know, and, and sharing, but man, I'm not the worst thing that ever happened to me. I am more than just my trauma. And when he said it, Marcus was kind of a jokester. So I thought he was just joking. But every, um, all the other young men kind of chimed in because Marcus said, you know, I actually want to talk about the fact that I want to open up my own coffee shop. And the other young man, another young man, Mark, uh, chimed in and he said, you know what? I want to open up, you know, my own T-shirt business. And they all began to change the conversation to focus on their aspirations and their dreams. They began to identify their own assets and how their own assets can be, become a healing elixir for their own well-being. Now, I was puzzled as I left that, that night and began to really reevaluate my own understanding of trauma-informed approaches. And I recognized while trauma-informed approaches are important, there were some elements of it that really needed some, um, that needed to be added on. And so when I we created healing-centered approaches and healing-centered engagement, there's a couple of features of healing-centered engagement that are important that build upon my knowledge of, of both trauma-informed uh, engagement, but really pushes us to think about the ways that healing can in, improve and enhance our engagement with young people who experience trauma. Next slide. So healing-centered engagement is, is an, a, a perspective on how we think about young people it's an approach as well as a strategy that allows us to address harm and restore well being. And it really focuses on supporting systems with shifting from a culture of harm and dis discipline and punishment to really restoring hope and well being and healing in the institution and among young people who are part of that system and institution. Next slide. And it, and, um, when we talk about healing-centered approaches, it focuses, what I learned from those young men, is that it is strength-based and that it provides a holistic view about thinking about young people. And it focuses and centers on identity and culture as a central feature of well-being. Why? Because oftentimes young people, the first harm that they experience in these environments is a harm and an assault to their identities whether they're African-American, whether they're GLBTQIA, whether they're, whether they're, uh, they're, they're second or third language Eng English speakers. And so it is an attack on their identity. And so it provides a culturally based response to well-being that focuses on the restoration of young people's identity and the recenters their culture. And next, next slide, please. And there are some distinctions between healing-centered engagement and trauma-informed approaches. The first is just a few distinctions. The first with trauma-informed care, it focuses on what happened to you, where trauma, uh, well, healing-centered approaches begins with an asset which focuses on what's right with you. The second is trauma-informed care tends to see harm and injury as episodic happening to individuals, where healing-centered approaches focuses on, on the, the holistic uh, more the holistic way of thinking about the ways in which trauma occurs collectively and healing occurs collectively. Trauma-informed approaches tend to focus on clinical and individual approaches where healing-centered looks and considers the environment that caused harm in the first place and, and really focuses on collective restoration. And lastly, Healing-centered approaches focus on the restoration and the well-being of the adults of providers. And this simply means that we cannot think about just delivering well-being and healing to young people without focusing on the well-being of the adult provider. The next slide. Um, so this is a missing ingredient, this notion that the well-being of the, the adult provider um, is significant and important in this ecosystem of well-being. Uh, um, so when we, uh, Commissioner Powell has already provided, I think an amazing roadmap to just thinking about what are the practices, the institutional practices that can support 
adult providers with their own well-being. And hopefully when I get to the examples, I'll be able to provide some ways that you can begin to see how uh, you could practice supports for well-being. But for right now, this is an important missing ingredient. And we recognize that the, the teaching workforce, that social workers and mental health providers, that the issues that they're, that they're on their caseloads sometimes makes it more difficult for them to be present and to have the transformative relationships that they need to support the well-being of young people. And so the question is, is what are the systems of support in your own organization for the well-being of your adult workforce? What are the practices that you use on a daily basis to support the well-being of your, of your adults? What are the values that you have in place? All of these things I want you to consider in thinking about creating an ecosystem of well-being for, um, uh, to create a healing-centered environment for your work. Next slide, please. So when we talk about integrating and using healing-centered engagement, next slide, um, we think about integrating healing-centered engagement at those three levels. We know that social toxicity exists at the individual level, it exists at the interpersonal in our relationships, and it actually it exists in the institution, the policies, the practices, and values. So the, we, we think about creating uh, uh, healing-centered environments at, uh, by focusing on all these three levels. Next, next slide. Um, we use um, these principles in our doing and designing healing-centered engagement in our organizations. I'm not gonna go through each and every principle in detail because I want to give you an example of these principles in practice in working with young people. And then I'll have some time to open it up for questions. Go to the next slide, please. And so we, the principles are, we call them the karma principles. And the karma principles are uh, basically are uh, focused on five key principles that are based in my own research, of years of research working with young people of color, as well as my engagement in working in communities. And those five principles are culture and identity, agency, relationships, meaning and aspirations. And I'll quickly kind of go over each of these, but I'm gonna give you some time to go provide you an example. So I'm not gonna go too deep into each one, but uh, for the purposes of this keynote, I wanna give you a flavor of how these principles land in creating healing-centered environments in, in, um, in organizations and neighborhoods. So the first, next slide, the first is culture. And when I talk about culture, culture focuses on identity. How do we begin to restore identity of young people? What and how do we acknowledge the identity of young people? Their racial identity, their gendered identity, their sexual identities, right? This means that we may have to have and figure out ways to have explicit conversations with young people about ways in which their identities may have been harmed and ways that we could think about restoring their identities. Next slide, please. Is the second is agency. And agency is really about uh, building the capacity of young people and their families to respond to the issues they have in their neighborhoods and in their environments. A agency is about um, providing young people with an education, a political education. Uh, and I'm not talking about political education in the sense of political parties. I'm talking about political education in, the, in terms of where does a power exist and how can you influence it in your school, in your neighborhood? It means that we're engaging young people in civic opportunities, ways that they can have a say and voice in the, in, in the in organizations and institutions that they participate in. Third, next slide, I'm sorry, uh, is relationships. And there's always two kinds of relationships. There's transactional relationships, which are relationships that are a function of your title. I am the case manager and you're the client or their transformative relationships, relationships that are built on our humanity, where we build close and transformative relationships with young people. This may look like opportunities to share your story with young people. Uh, this might look like building a, a, a value of belonging and inclusiveness in your organization. The fourth principle is meaning. Next slide, thank you, uh, is meaning. And this is really about reminding ourselves, reminding young people, reminding our, our, our communities about why this work is so important, right? This may look like 
uh, oftentimes we call this these practices professional development, right? Um, but we might want to begin to think about the personal development that is necessary to actually have more profound impact as a professional. You invest in professional development. It doesn't necessarily mean you address the personal issues. But if you invest in personal development, you get a better human being that can actually have a profound impact in their professional setting. Meaning means that we're reminding ourselves is why this, why is this work important? And family, uh, family and Youth Services Bureau has already demonstrated and has already made the, the commitment around uh, building meaning and reminding uh, the partners around why this work is important and building a movement for youth engagement and, and youth and adult partnerships. And the last slide is aspirations. And aspirations is the lesson that I learned uh, from my conversations with these young men in Laney College. And it is um, my lesson that I learned in um, that, that moment in the prison when he blew those bubbles. And that is, is how do we actually begin to create a space of possibility? How do we listen to young people's dreams? And how do we build, that, build the structure and the opportunities for them to pursue those dreams? I wanna spend a couple of, uh, just a, a moment with some concrete examples about how communities are actually using these principles of healing-centered engagement in their work with young people. I'm gonna provide you with just two examples. Uh, next slide. Uh, just two examples. One of the examples is going to be an example of aspirations. And the next example will be an exa example of how to cultivate transformative relationships. And then from there, I hope to have an opportunity uh, to spend some time with you answering questions. Um, and so the first example, don't, don't, you don't need to go to the, um, uh, well, you can go to the next slide. Uh, the, the first example is um, uh, around trans, uh, transformative and transactional relationships. Um, the first, so, so when we talk about transactional and transformative relationships, it means that we are building relationships that transgress, that go beyond our titles, where we build trust, opportunities for vulnerability, and tr uh, uh, opportunities for us to, to where people, uh, where young people can begin to see us outside of the context of our, 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 ro our employment role. Um, next slide. This is an example of, um, so transformative relationships are built on care, transparency, trust, and perceived uh, vulnerability, right? Uh, next slide. So, this is uh, the city of Richmond. And if you can see the black outline, the city of Richmond is about, um, you know, it's a, small, it's a small area of the city of Richmond, which is about three miles by two miles. It's very small. But this, this area had the highest shooting and homicide rate per capita in the entire country, particularly in California. And the city, was responding to the increasing homicide rates by hiring more police officers. But the hiring of police officers did not translate to the lowering of shootings and, and homicides. So a colleague of mine, his name is Devon Bogan, came up with a brilliant idea. He said, what if we hire formerly incarcerated young men and women who really know the young people in this community and develop loving, caring relationships with them to get them to, re to get to reduce the gun violence. First, the city of Richmond said, no, we're not gonna do that, that's crazy. And then they came back and they actually provided him funding to create what is called the Office of Neighborhood Safety. Next slide. And this is exactly what he did. He built the Office of Neighborhood Safety, built on these following five principles. And the fifth principle you'll know, and I'm not gonna go through all of them. The fifth principle is the relationship is the intervention and the intervention is the relationship. And that was something that they practice. In my own observations of young, of watching them build transformative relationships, it actually didn't look like they were doing much when I would follow them. You can go to the next slide. And it looked like they would, you know, kind of go to young men and they would talk to them and have conversations. But there's something that they said every, at, after every interaction they had with young men. And these are young men who are out of school, who are not in school, who hanging out on the street. They would say, hey, you know, I want you to be alive and free. And they would also say, you know, I love you, right? I know that sounds corny, right? That I love you and I want you to be alive and free. But if you do that over time, every day, 
they would also follow that up with, hey, hey, um, uh, hey, Greg, I know your brother, you know, I know he needs some cleats for, for his basketball, I mean, for his football game. Or he, they would say, hey, Howard, I talked to your mama. She needed some groceries. Go take these groceries to your mama. And they would develop these relationships where they were almost begin to, see, begin to be seen like a surrogate uncle. One of the things that the Office of Neighborhood Safety would always say is they would never tell these young men not to carry guns. Now, I know that seems odd. They would say, I know you, you have to carry guns, but if you need to use a gun, please call us first. There was an incident that unfortunately transpired where there was a shooting, but the young men rec real, uh, remembered what these young men would say. You can go to the next slide. Um, they remembered what the, the men in the Office of Neighborhood Safety would say. They would say, I, want you, I love you, man. You know, I want you to be alive and free and to call me first. This is a picture of Joe with the Office of Neighborhood Safety working with a young man. And after that shooting, uh, the young men that they were working with said, hey, man, we got to um, we got to retaliate on who shot up our party. It was a party uh, that was shot up. But before going and retaliating, going to the nearby park, they remembered what Joe said. Give me a call first. So they called Joe and they all went. Uh, they called Joe. It was late at night and Joe picked up the phone. And they said, hey, man, you know, there's a shooting. And Joe said, yeah, I know there was a shooting, man. I know that's too bad. Um, uh, I know you guys got to do what you got to do, but check it this out. Let's go get some pizza first. Now, I know that sounds funny. It sounds weird. <laughs> Let's go get some pizza. But for 13, 14, 15 year old boys, it made sense. So Joe went and got pizza with them and he was able to de-escalate them because they trusted him. They saw him as a father figure or an uncle figure, and he was able to get them to not retaliate against the, uh, the, the young men who had shot up their party. Now, if you're able to de-escalate these young men day in and day out, over and over, this is the results that you get. Next slide. Next slide. So they started in 2009 with 45 homicides. They started the program in 2010, and the results by 2014, they had brought down the shooting rate down to, 2000, uh, down to 12. That rate has remained below that to this very day, so much so that they're taking that model and they're extending it beyond, um, beyond Richmond to get other people to learn how to create transformative relationships in their work with young people. You can go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. So um, I want to start, I want to end with one last story before uh, we, we open this up for questions. And um, in that circle that I shared with you at Laney College, there was a young man, his name was John. And John um, was uh, homeless at the time. He was selling drugs at the time. He was... Um, he was involved with all types of, uh, you know, he was involved, he was, he was, his life was in peril, but he came to the, the trauma-informed circle every, you know, every Thursday night. And all the young men began to share what they wanted to see in their lives. Some said, I want to have a coffee shop. I want a TV. I want to open up my own t-shirt company. John said, you know what I want to do, Dr. Jenner? I just want to, op I want to uh, be a firefighter and I'd like to have a happy family. And um, every kind of everyone kind of laughed at John because you know he was his he was his he 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 had a lot going on in his life. I was in a speech in Chicago about six months ago, and I had lost touch with some of these young men, and they had my cell phone number, and from time to time they would send me a text about what was going on in their lives. And I received a message after this keynote from John as I got into the taxi back, headed back, he, headed to the airport. It said, hey, Dr. G. And I said, hey, John, how you doing? He said, I'm doing great. Guess what? And I said, what? And the next um, image I got, I don't think this image is in this deck, unfortunately, but the image I got was an image of John in an Oakland firefighter uniform hugging his beautiful wife 
with three beautiful children standing in front of a fire truck. He said, I'm a firefighter now. This healing thing works and thank you. It was, and when he, when he shared that, it really touched me because it was an example of how his aspirations and how his ability to see himself in the future transformed his life into something that he dreamed about. And this is just one example of how we can engage in transformative relationships and how we can use these healing-centered principles to shift our systems in ways that saturate young people with healing opportunities, that saturate young people with opportunities to thrive. Um, you can go to the next slide. Next slide. So I, I hope that there's something that I've shared with you that has informed, inspired, or challenged you to begin to think about how we can engage and drive healing-centered opportunities into our work. We are, a, we are now a nation right now that is on the precipice of either continuing to address and chip away at our exposure to trauma or really transform our institutions and our systems in ways that saturate young people and their families with opportunities to heal. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share these ideas with you. And I look forward to having um, an opportunity to share questions with you. You can, um, you can uh, take down the slide deck now. Thanks. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Jinwright. That it was so eye-opening, I think, for many of our, um, our attendees who are doing this work and feeling this work. And through our work at RISEC, we have seen communities engaging in this, young people leading in this work, and institutions figuring out how they heal in their communities. My name is Meredith Hicks, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of the Runaway and Homeless Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center. I am so excited to have an opportunity to share some questions and answers um, during this time today. So attendees, if you have questions, please add them in the chat and I will be asking um, Dr. Jen Wright your questions. So the first question um, that came in is from Renee Marshall. How do you discern what is culture and what is harmful without disrespecting the culture aspect of individuals? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think the, you know, the, when we, when we think about aspects of culture, aspects of culture are restorative, right? They, they are, they are, they are community. They, they are built in, you know, around trust. Um, and so, you know, for example, I can give you a really quick example. So in my own work, I had to detangle what is healthy and what is um, not healthy, what is culture and what is not culture in my own work with African-American youth as they use the N-word. And that practice, right, one could say, okay, that's just their culture. That's the word that they use and accept that. And what I always do and have, what our training suggests is you start where young people are. They have so much critique. So it doesn't mean you have to say, don't say that, but you give young people alternative language, alternative experiences so that they choose for themselves ways that they wanna show up. The young people that we work with here in Oakland and San Francisco use the term brother and sister. And that is a conscious effort of, of our work trying to give them alternative ways that use to describe themselves and ways to describe the, the people that they love and they work with. And so this is one way that we can begin to detangle, you know, issues of that are harmful and issues that are cultural. And I hope that was an, not too convoluted of an, ex, of an example in responding to your question. No, that was very helpful. Thank you. Um, another question came in about the city of Richmond. And what convinced the city of Richmond to support and fund the Office of Neighborhood Safety and its relationship building approach after first being resistant to do so? Yeah, great question. A uh, couple of things. Um, one, I did not get into the detail uh, and the, the analysis of what is the root cause of crime and shootings in North Richmond. And one of the ways that um, that shifted the city is they recognize and really begin to understand that 85% of the shootings were done by about 30 young people. Mm -hmm. Y'all hear me? About 30 young people 
were responsible for about 85% of the shootings. And the approach by the neighborhood safety, so that's one. Two, the approach that they could use only required them to divert, um, they didn't need to cut the, the, the budget for public safety or the police. They didn't need to, to cut it. All they needed to do was in, uh, 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 take some city funds, um, pilot funds, to support um, three or four uh, outreach workers, right? And so they were able to do it at a cost less than it would cost to hire several uh, co uh, police officers. Thirdly, um, it was a pilot program. They weren't committed to it, right? And, and so they, if it didn't work, then they would they would not actually support it. So, but after a year, and they began to see the decline, they began to invest in it. And just one note that the program never referred to the young men as shooters; they referred to them as fellows, as fellows. Be they began to use the funds to take those young men in that neighborhood to Washington D.C. They took them to South Africa. They, 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 they built, built opportunities for them to have pathways to college. They've invested in them. And um, my own work with the Office of Neighborhood Safety, we actually held mental health healing circles for the adult workers because the young, the men that were released, that were formerly incarcerated, they had stuff they needed to deal with, right? They had triggers in working with these young men, but they needed tools and they needed the support. And so the, the, the relationships that they were able to form actually translated to a reduction in crime. I, I'm probably talking too much and not answering your question, but hopefully I'm, I'm getting at it. No, that was great. Thank you for that additional detail. And um, as you were sharing that, it reminded me of some of the opening remarks from our Associate Commissioner Kimberly Waller and being innovative and piloting and using data to, to strengthen that case and figure out what can be sustained and what are our old practices that need to be uh, that we need to move beyond to really meet the needs of youth in communities. So there's Absolutely. a lot of common threads throughout today. Another question, um, how do we start the work of letting youth lead the process of when and where they are vulnerable with us and move towards transformational relationships? Well, understanding there are many reasons why youth may not always seek transformation with us. That may be coming from a direct provider or frontline staff perspective. Yeah, no, the great, great question, great question. Um, the, 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 I think it's really important first to for you to define what what does a transformed relationship look like to you, right? And also be able to have some understanding of what that might look like for a young person. Oftentimes, we impose what we think should be a transformed relationship to that young person. Um, so that's one thing is to, is to really have an honest expectation about how you want to show up. Um, and is your relationships um, transformative enough to move that young person from where they are to where they want to be, not where you want to be, but where they want to be? That's first. And second, how many opportunities have you had to share your story with them? Right? What do those spaces look like? Your story is not you know, your professional story. But it is actually creating a space of vulnerability, right? Where where are you able to be human with a young person? And I know for those of you who are trained as social workers, as therapists, that there there are disclosure um, boundaries that that are, are 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 important in the profession. And I'm not suggesting that you violate your training, but what I am suggesting is how do you actually begin to expand what is appropriate or what is vulnerable to a young person. Sharing your story about maybe you were homeless, maybe you were a, a young person that left home. Um, perhaps maybe you've experienced some um, challenges with your, with your caregivers. Perhaps were you in foster care? What were those challenges? Your ability to have those conversations, give young people the avenue, right? The permission to share their story as well. And in that sharing of stories, you begin to build strong transformative relationships over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that ties into another question that just came in because you're, you're maybe talking about a shift in, in those relationships. So um, this came in from Thomas Fulton. The classically taught social worker relationship with the client is to not have a personal relationship um, only as a therapist. This transformational role seems to assume that there is a personal relationship. Is that correct? 
Um, if so, could this approach change not only the process of intervention, but how we're training social workers and who we're engaging in this space? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I just kind of mentioned the, the, the sort of the sort of challenges around social work and therapy, right? Um, it's difficult to to engage in a transformative relationship by you staying in your box. That's just my experience. And that basically suggests that um, where are the spaces? Where can you actually begin to be more vulnerable and share pieces of who you are as a human being as a way to, to engage those relationships? So it's, what is the phrase, um, the young people don't care what you know until they know that you care? right? Something like that. I don't know if I got it right. But part of that is I got to know you, right? Culturally in Latino and Latinx and African-American communities, if I don't know you, you're just a person that's coming into my neighborhood kind of providing social work, mm -hmm. right? Transformative relation. And here's how I know a transformative relationship. So, so all, all folks that are listening, if you could say, I talked to your mama last week and she said, or I talked to your, your 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 grandmama said whatever, right? In other words, that you have a relationship with that young person that's beyond the professional relationship in that particular case time that you have allocated. Now I know that if you have a caseload of forty, it's hard to do that, right? It, it might be hard to do that, but this is where your supervisors, your organizations, have to think about ways and structures to allow you to actually have the time to create those kind of opportunities. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, how do we, no, I already asked that one, sorry. Um, what would you suggest for getting organizations to provide more funding for these types of methods of responding to trauma when it relates to causes such as parental violence, teen domestic violence, or feelings of abandonment, which give in some cases the platform for self-harm? Can you read that again? I want to make sure I heard the right, the first part of your, your question. How, yeah. How you... What would you suggest for getting organizations to provide more funding for non-traditional methods of responding yeah. to trauma? Okay. You... Yeah. So I think responding to trauma is twofold, right? And what we have now in our society is onefold, which is respond to trauma, which is fix the brokenness, which is respond to the harm, which is address the mental health. That's necessary, right? I'm, 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 I shouldn't be shaking my fist at the camera. So let me, <laughs> get, see, I'm getting animated here. Sorry, y'all, but I don't want to shake my fist at the camera. So one is to respond to the harm and the hurt and provide those kind of mental health supports, which are important. The, but we also have, we can add to that, which is build upon the, identify the assets and build upon the assets. So how do you, how do you actually begin to attract more funding and resources and support for that? You have to begin to articulate that young people also are, have assets, that they may experience harm, but that does not define them. That research shows that by building on assets and aspirations, using karma principles, that you actually provide opportunities for healing and well-being. You have to re-narrate the funding opportunities. You have to remind funders federal, state, private, philanthropy, remind them that re responding to brokenness is half of the equation, that the other half is building from their possibilities. And by doing that, you create a more holistic approach to creating the environments and supporting young people and their families in ways that lead them, uh, that allow them to experience and lead them into uh, to flourishing and well-being. Beautifully said, thank you. Do you have any closing thoughts for our attendees? We have almost, we have 2000 people registered for this event. Um, so I know a lot of people are seeing this. Um, what closing thoughts or advice do you have them as they begin their work or continue their work or begin their work into healing centered engagement in their communities and in partnership with young people? Well, just three things. One, continue the work and the movement around assets and youth engagement and youth engagement partnerships. You are already uh, changing the nation's dialogue and thinking about young people. Um, uh, secondly, be sure to take time for yourselves and figure out there are ways of systems of support to actually 
create and sustain your engagement in this work. Right? It is so important that we build those systems of support. Um, everything from when you have your next staff meeting, instead of jumping into the agenda, add 10 more minutes so that everybody can do an emotional check-in. How are you feeling today? What is your greatest aspirations for this week? What are you, what are you dreaming about for your clients, right? Just um, what, is a challenge, what is a challenge that you wanna solve? Uh, whatever it is, take some space in your next staff meeting to cultivate um, those spaces of well-being, just, just little micro doses. And third, if you really want to learn more about these practices, just go to our website, flourishagenda.com, and you can have an opportunity to learn about more about how people around the country are using these practices in their systems, and we'd be happy to provide you that support. But thank you so much for the opportunity and keep this movement. We need, we need this work. Um, we need uh, opportunities to transform the lives of young people. So thank you for, um, thank you, uh, Family and Youth Services Bureau and Runaway and Homeless Youth Training and Technical Census Center. Keep up the great work.